Well, we are in First uh, Corinthians chapter ten, verse twenty-three, and um, it says, "All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable." And this is the second time he's saying this. We did this a few chapters back. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. And then he says, all things are lawful, but not all things edify. Do you know what edif- edify means? It means to encourage someone other. It means to build someone else up, right? And so um, they're in a unique spot where... Uh, a lot of them were Jewish, not to the Corinthians, obviously. The Corinthians were not Jewish. It was a polytheistic society, but, um, which means there were just many gods. But um, it's an amazing thing to say all things are lawful, meaning you're free to do anything you want, right? But there's some, there, even though there's no rules, then he puts a rule on it. Not everything edifies other people. And so you could do anything you want, but keep in mind this, this rule of love. This rule that says, you know what? I'm not going to do something that causes someone else to stumble. In fact, I'm going to do things that cause my brothers and sisters to be edified, to build them up, right? I want to do those things. So I could do anything I want, but... The only debt, the Bible says the only debt that you have is the debt of love to one another. It's the new covenant and the new command is to love one another, right? But I feel like as I was studying this week, I feel like you guys do this really well. I feel like this is something that we do well at this church. And seeing you guys step out... um, Seeing you guys, you know, going to the, the foster care homes and seeing many of you go and just love on these kids, seeing you guys love on one another. It's just amazing, you know? I feel like you guys do this really well. I'm going to skip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, where Paul says, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Be imitators of me. So he's basically, some versions say, follow me as I follow Christ, right? And that's, for some people, that's a, it may sound a little bit prideful, I guess you could say. But I want to challenge you with something because I had a dream this week, two nights ago. I had a dream that I was standing here, it looked like a Sunday morning, and I was teaching, but I was teaching you guys, I was saying, you coach them. It kept coming out of my mouth in this dream. And I would go over here and say, you coach them. And I would go over here and I'd say, you coach them. And it kept going on and on in my dream. And so I feel like there's a, a level that, um, that we're at, we need to break through because this, you guys know this is a training center, right? It's, it's not, uh, every church has its own unique flavor. And mission and DNA, right? So our, we're a training center, and, and sometimes that means we don't necessarily hold people's hands to walk them through. It's kind of like we just kick them out of the nest, you know? It's like, you're ready, go fly. And we're there for you to help equip you and send you out. This is, a, a training center is, is a place, not where you gather people, which is kind of sad, and over the years, Andrea and I have sent out so many people, so many of our best people, seeing them, you know, God calling them in different ways. But that's kind of the nature of the thing is to equip people and see them fly, right? And so it's not so much to gather, but to send out, to send people out. That's what we do. We believe in people. We try to help them define what God's put on their heart. And then we just kick them out. Like, we're glad to see you come, and we love that you're here, but Holy Spirit lives in you, and he wants out. And so I just want to challenge you. With that dream, I feel like God was saying something to us as a body, that it's time not to just be fed by milk. It's time to get your own breakthrough. And so that you can say, like Paul, 
follow me as I follow Christ. And what that's going to take, really, is I know there's some people here that are watching ministers on YouTube and maybe wondering, I wonder if God's ever going to call me to do my own ministry or call me out like that. And I want to say, yeah, he already has. When the Spirit comes upon you, it comes upon you for a purpose. There, there's, there's no sugarcoating that. Or there's, there's, when the Spirit comes upon you, it's for a purpose. There's a purpose in your life. Now, you may ask me, Joe, what is my purpose? What am I supposed to do? I don't know because I'm not you. You're going to do something that's so unique and it's going to reach people that I won't reach. Right? And so I want to tell you, dream a dream and go do something. It's going to be the, the, the craziest adventure you'll ever go on. We have so many testimonies of people that have come to this place broken and now are leading ministries. It's so amazing. It's so amazing to watch, you know, that every person here has a calling. And I don't know what that calling is, but it's easier to steer a ship that's moving than to steer a ship that's sitting still. And so you just start moving, just start doing something, right? You're going to come up with creative ideas that the person next to you won't. They'll come up with something different, and they're going to reach people. You're going to reach someone that I won't. You're very unique. But I want you to be able to say, follow me as I follow Christ. For you to, to, to say that to your disciples. Does that sound weird? Your disciples? A true disciple of Christ finds people and disciples them. That's how he trained them. He didn't just disciple them and say, okay, I just want you to listen to me and just keep soaking up all the teaching and just keep getting all the information until it builds and builds and builds. And, right? He said... I'm sending you out. That's what he said to his disciples. Three years. And he said, it's better that I go. I feel like there's some times, you know, obviously, biblically, Jesus never leaves us. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. But how many of you know that when a, a father coaches his child in baseball, and he shows him, he's, he's holding his hands with him, and he shows him how to swing. At some point, the father's got to go into the stands and leave his son there to try to make a hit, right? How about, how about if a coach is coaching a, a gymnast and is, is guarding her? And you, get, you ever, ever seen those films about people like, like catching them before they like break their neck or something when they're practicing? But at some point, the coach has to go to the sidelines and say, you got this, right? And I feel like that's what happens sometimes when God is so close to us that we hear his voice every day and he's nurturing us and he's, there's like this amazing relationship that's taking place. And all of a sudden, you may have felt this, all of a sudden there comes a situation and you don't feel that God's next to you. You don't feel his voice. You don't feel his, his step-by-step instructions. Anyone ever feel that? And I feel like, obviously, Jesus will never leave you. But he told the disciples, it's better that I go. <laughs> it's better that I go. Why? I'm passing the baton to you. And there are times where we feel like he's not right next to us, but it's on purpose because he said, I set you, he says, I set you up for success. You have everything that you need. Now go for it. Go make something. Go create something. Go touch somebody. Go disciple somebody. Right? And the, the questions always come, well, who am I to disciple? Well, maybe I need to go to Bible school or I need to do this or I need... No, you're, you're ready. You're equipped. It's, it's kind of like the, the testimony of the guy who got healed of blindness, right? And they keep asking him. And his testimony isn't this theological thing. It's just, I was blind, now I can see. You know? And Jesus did that. And we point everyone to Jesus. We can all do that. 
But I feel like there needs to be a shift in our mindset. And I had that dream to tell you, you coach them. You be a coach now. You've been coached. Now you be a coach. You are all leaders in this place. I don't know what you're going to do with the gospel. I don't know how you're going to present the gospel. That's up to you. And I think there, that our good, good father in heaven is so excited to see what you're going to do. Like, do you understand that when you have an orphan or a slave mentality, you only do what you're told because you're afraid to make a mistake. But when you have a son, a son or daughter mentality, you're not afraid to make a mistake. You just step out and because you know God is so delighted. Your father is so delighted in you. Just going for it, you know? Swing that bat, son. Do that flip, daughter. Go for it. And I want you to know that God has something in store for you. And you're going to say to someone else, follow me as I follow Christ. Be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. And you may be feeding up to this point. You may be feeding on sermons on YouTube. You may be feeding on someone else's worship. But you know what it's time for? It's time that you find that nugget. That you dig your own hole and you find that gold. It's time that you get your own revelation. That you write that book that's on your heart. That you create that ministry that you've been passionate for. That you create a solution for something in the church that you're seeing is lacking. You know that when you see something lacking in the church, could be this church, could be the church as a whole, when you see something lacking, it's most likely because God's put that in your heart to fill that gap. You be the answer to your own prayers. We're ready for this. You feel ready? Well, I, I don't care if you're, you feel ready. <laughs> Just a rhetorical question. So many times I don't feel ready. But that's the whole dependence on the Holy Spirit. You don't have to feel ready. Just step out and do something. Just step out of the boat. See if that water holds your foot. God didn't say it wouldn't be scary. He said, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. Come on. Let's do this. Where do you start? With your neighbor? Start a Bible study in your office. Start by just having a block party. I don't know. Do a Bible study in an apartment building. I don't know what it's going to lead to. But if you try a bunch of things, then you're going to, you're going to see the one that really makes you come alive. Right? I mean, the easiest thing is make brownies for your neighbor. I mean, everyone can do that. Everyone loves brownies. <laughs> Be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. <clears throat> Many of us think that Paul was just this demigod, you know? <laughs> like, just this close to God Almighty. Sometimes we treat him like that. And all the apostles, and Luke, and everyone who's written these scriptures. But you know, Paul was a man. 
Paul was a man just like you and me who got a hold of the Holy Spirit, who stepped out of the boat and said, you know what, I have a mission. I want everyone to hear this gospel that I carry. I don't know if it went well the very first time he tried it out. I don't know. I don't know about the second, third time. I don't know. I, I know John Wimber, the, the, he, the breakthrough, the, uh, the modern healing movement was started by John Wimber. He said he prayed for 10 years before anyone got healed. 10 years. Imagine if he would have given up at year seven. <laughs> you know? Andre and I saw this movie. <clears throat> it's, in a, it's just a really cool movie. It's a true story called A Million Miles Away. And it's, um, it's this Hispanic guy who would come across with his family. He was little. And, um, and you know, picking the farms. But they would have to move all over California. And they were saving for a house in Mexico. And he was a little guy, but he'd be picking whatever, produce or whatever, and he would be going to different schools. Well, there was this one school where the teacher said, recognized how smart he was, and tried to meet with his parents and say, you, you can't just keep moving around. This, this kid is smart. You have to, you know, um, steward his education. And they obviously were like, well, we have to survive. We have to make money. We have to do this and that. And, and so eventually the dad decided okay, I'm going to forget the house that I've been saving for in Mexico, and I'm going to invest, and I'm going to stay in one place. And so this guy, his dream, his little kid, his dream wasn't to be an astronaut. And lots of people laughed at him and all that stuff. Um, and he drew a picture for his teacher and said, I want to be an astronaut. And, and he, got, he became an engineer, and he applied to NASA for for 12 years, every single year he applied to become an astronaut to go to space. And he was denied every single time. And then he finally walked it in there. On the 12th time, he got accepted. And then he got accepted to go, actually, he, he, he went to the International Space Station. And it was just an amazing thing. But right before he was going to get on, um, someone came to speak to him. And it was his teacher from 30 years ago who spoke into his life and said, you could do this. And he told his teacher, you changed my life. And she pulled out this wrinkled paper of his drawing. It was such a cool movie. And just hardship after hardship, and he finally made it. He had this dream that was, seemed so audacious, but he finally made it, and he went. From an in immigrant um, field worker, you know, family. It's just amazing. I encourage you. It, it's PG, so it's good. Like, there's, it's hard to find a good movie these days, you know, but <clears throat> it's so amazing. I always think about, you know, the different people in the Bible that God called. You know, they got a call on their life. Like Moses, that's one of the biggest ones. You know, burning bush experience, he got a, he got a call from the Lord, right? Um, Joshua called. You know, so many different people. David was called. But I, I'm... I bet you that there were so many people in Bible times that were called and didn't answer the call. These are the only ones that we know about. These are the only ones that, that were recorded, right? But, you know, it said that he had five, Jesus had 500 disciples. And they all left and 12, were, 12 remained. And he told them, are you, you, you going to leave too? You know, he wasn't, he, he didn't mince words, man. He was, he was like straightforward, you know. He didn't coddle people. He said, it's better for, I, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off now, so you guys got this. <laughs> After three years, could you imagine? You guys got this. This ministry that I've built, now you guys got it. But he had, at one point, 500, and they, they all left. And that wasn't because they weren't called. He called them. He taught all of them. But there was only a fraction of them that actually stayed. And who knows, maybe they were like David's mighty men who they had nowhere to go anyway, you know? Who knows what the reason was. But if you will stay in this fight, if you will stay faithful to the thing that God's called you to do, 
I don't care what the odds look like. I don't care if the circumstances just are going the, a, a different direction. The thing that God has put in your heart, be faithful to that. Because the ones that don't give up, they win. But so many times we give up when it gets too hard. Or someone talks us out of it. Oh yeah, that's the voice of wisdom. It's a voice of fear a lot of times. Fear is masqueraded as wisdom. But if you would just keep on going, don't allow that thing that God's put in your heart to seem like it's just a waste of time. It's never going to happen. You're, you're the only one that can fight for that. You're the only one that can say, you know what, God? I believe you're going to do something here. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I believe you're going to do something, right? And I'm not saying, you know, I could care less about a ministry with thousands of people or like millions of followers or whatever. That doesn't really do anything for me. But if you touch a person and change their life, I mean, the biggest miracle is that someone's heart is changed from death to life. That is the biggest miracle. If you touch one person and they get saved, that is a successful ministry, you know? We're not talking about the, now it's almost like the world's idea of what a successful ministry is. I could care less about that. But I care about souls. And if you can touch one soul that they would flop over to the kingdom, wow. That's amazing. That's eternal. They'll be thanking you for all of eternity. It's worth the fear of rejection. It's worth the inconvenience. It's worth it for someone's soul. And I'm not saying that all of you are evangelists. But we've all read the Great Commission. Somehow, what you have to offer God is a part of that. That is the overarching mission of Jesus to set the world free. Your expression of faith somehow is a piece of the puzzle to that overarching mission. When we work together and we're all working, we're going to see that happen. Eric got a word this morning. I, I, it's going to be more powerful when he shares it, but he was just, he had a vision of just seeing people coming to the Lord, like um, movie stars and things, like people with influence or whatever. Not that that's, you know, the goal, but he just said that there's, a, there's an atmosphere coming because like the world is, is so crazy that people are going to just start coming to the Lord. And it's so amazing because, you know, just this weekend, Dre and I were reading about some of the Hollywood celebrities like that have come to the Lord, actors and stuff just recently have come to the Lord. And it's amazing. And I'm not the type that's like, okay, if we can just get one popular person to come to the Lord, then we're going to see revival. No, but it's just amazing. And with what they're facing, the environment that they're in to come to the Lord, it's, it's, it's pretty much like when we were in India, when they come to the Lord, they give up their whole life. You know, because they're disowned, their inheritance is gone, their community is gone, their job is gone. When you give your life to the Lord in India, your life is over, basically. Right? And it's kind of like that in Hollywood. You've seen Jim, uh, Jim Caville. When he did that, The Passion of the Christ... You know, Mel Gibson told him, hey, if you do this movie, this Christian movie, your career will be over, basically. And we've seen that in Hollywood. You, there's the people that are in and people that are out. And you start preaching Jesus. And so that's why I think it's so amazing when someone in Hollywood gives their life to the Lord. Because you know it's serious, man. But I just feel like you guys 
are going to be involved in winning souls and discipling people. Because we've been hearing this prophetically over the last four or five years about this harvest that's coming in. And we're seeing it. I want all of you not to be in the stands, but to be on the field. And that's not going to feed my ego. That's not because I want to look good. That's not because I want to grow the church. To be honest with you, I don't want to grow the church. I don't want another service, okay? I'm just being honest. It doesn't, it doesn't fulfill me at all. The staff knows that. They're like, Joe, you, have to, you know, we have to be... A, I'm like, no, I don't want to grow. I love my people. And, um, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> it's just not... I, I want to... I say that for you because I don't want anyone to have any regrets in heaven. When you're in heaven, I guarantee you, you're going to say, gosh, I could have done more. But if you just... If you continue to step out and say, you know what, my, my job is not why I'm here on planet Earth. It's not just to survive, right? But I have a job, I have a neighborhood, I have these things because they were ordained by God for me to be in that particular place at at this particular time. Because there's people that I'm going to reach. And you may hate your job. But I guarantee you, you get that mindset, you're going to love your job. It's going to be the most exciting thing ever, right? You may wish you were in a Christian environment. Believe me, you don't want to work here at church. It's boring. Everyone's saved. You can't witness. I try to witness down the hall, and Eric said, I've heard this already. When I was a graphic designer in Long Beach, it was so exciting to go into the office and just be like, God, how can I reach someone today? It was. It's so exciting. You guys have this opportunity to step out of the boat. That water will hold you because Jesus is with you. Just step out of the boat. If, G, if, if God is truly your provider, right? If God the Father is truly your provider, Will you have enough boldness to talk about Jesus at your workplace? You are not your own provider. God is. I just don't want anything to hold you back. Because there's, you're going to do something that is going to be so cool that we're all going to celebrate. And we're all going to celebrate each other as we see amazing things happen, as you go out of this place. Amazing things happen in here. But I'm talking about out there. I want to send you out. I want to send you out today. You're a missionary in the South Bay. That's what you are. That's what the original plan was. The original church in the the book of Acts was that they were bent on being the church. That word church is called out ones, ecclesia, called out ones. We can't say we're a church if we're just huddling up here. That's just a club. (laughs) You have the most amazing message. Go share it with somebody. You may not share it like the person next to you shares it. That's okay. But just go create relationships. Go befriend somebody. Go out of your way to help someone out. That's how it starts. Right? And I want you guys to say to others, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. When we were singing that song, Dan was singing that song, um, 
the Lord uh, gives and takes away. <clears throat> I know, I understand that that refers to the book of Job. Job quoted that. He said, God gives, God takes away, may the name of the Lord be praised. He was saying, no matter what happens, I'm going to praise the Lord. And this is totally amazing. And I know that that's where that song comes from. But I just saw this thing of when he was singing that, I saw the giving and taking is something a little different. I saw God giving joy and removing depression. I saw God giving peace and taking away anxiety. I saw God giving reconciliation and taking away strife. It's just so amazing. He's such a good God. He's such a good God. I just want you to stand up. <clears throat> Because I feel like um, God is going to give you that exchange right now. If there's something that's been heavy on your heart, I just want you to give it to the Lord. Have you, if you've been feeling anxiety and you've ever said out loud, oh, my anxiety or my depression or my fears or whatever, they're not yours. You don't have to own them. Throw them back to where they came from. And God wants to give you something instead. So if you can just, whatever you want to do in your imagination, just give that over to the Lord. Put it at the foot of the cross. And then open your hands up and wait for something that God's going to give you in return. That you're making a big trade today. I just see anxiety of being a provider just falling off. Just falling off. I see worry of your children. Just trade that in for trust in a good father. Just trade that in. I see a heaviness on someone that you don't know why it's there or how to shake it. But the Bible says he gives rejoicing for the spirit of heaviness. The Bible defines that heaviness as a spirit. And I just command that heaviness to fall off right now in Jesus' mighty name. And I just replace it with joy and gladness, rejoicing. Andrea was spending time with the Lord this week and she, she told me, God just spoke to me and said, the greatest weapon is trust. And you, sometimes we don't think that as a weapon, we think of it as more as a, a passive thing. But when you trust the Lord, it's like a sword cutting off the head of your enemies. When you say, you know what, God, you got this. I'm going to trust you then that fear all of a sudden just falls. It loses its power. Yeah, come Lord. Come minister to us, God. As we make these trades with you, come minister to us right now. Wow, we thank you, God. We thank you, God. I just, I don't know why I keep getting this image of someone 
with, with uh, their veins, like some sort of a, a blood issue, or maybe it's a, a blood clot issue, or maybe it's a, um, what do you call it when the, when the veins are clogged? There's a blockage. I feel like there may be people here that are facing that. And God has healing for you today. I want to invite the ministry team to come forward. And if that's you, come on up. Get prayer for that. I think so many times we, we need music to focus. <laughs> I think this silence is actually really good. Can, can you... Keep your mind and heart focused on the Lord. And just allow him to keep ministering to you. Because being in that flow is so important. Just being able to stay in that flow. That is so important to getting your breakthrough. So that no... If you're getting your breakthrough from a worship band or from a preacher or for anything else, from anything else or anyone else, I want you to practice getting that breakthrough straight from Holy Spirit. Ask for wisdom and revelation straight from Him. Let Him feed you. Let Him minister to you. Get that breakthrough. He doesn't hide things from you. He hides things for you. There are things hidden for you, only you to discover. Out of anyone I understand, when you're in prayer or whatever, I understand distraction. But it's a fight that you have to, you have to battle with that. You have to fight to keep that focus on God. True fruit comes from abiding in Him. I feel like there's also um, someone who has a problem with their ankle. Maybe ankle pain. And I'm sure there's other things. I want you to come forward right now. <clears throat> come on and just... Uh, Receive prayer today. Sorry, you don't have to wait. Come on, come on up. <clears throat> I know it seems quiet in here. Why don't have the worship team come on up? <clears throat> For those of you who can't take the silence. <clears throat> Jesus, we love you so much. <clears throat> we want more of you, God. I pray... We all pray for boldness, just like in the book of Acts. When they got released from jail, the first thing they prayed for was boldness, that they would continue to speak of your words, continue to spread the gospel. And we need your boldness, not our boldness. I pray that your boldness, Holy Spirit, would come upon us for such a time as this. I pray for those dreams to be awakened in Jesus' name those passions of the heart that you placed there at birth, that just like with Jeremiah, you said, I formed you in your mother's womb to be a prophet. I pray that those things in, that are built into the spiritual DNA of each person would come to the surface, would come to the surface today, that it wouldn't be hidden anymore. It wouldn't just be a pipe dream. It wouldn't be some far off thing, but it would be like, this is what I was born to do. This is what I was made for. And it could be as simple as just loving on people. But you know what you were put here on the earth to do. I pray for that boldness and for those dreams to be awakened, God. I ask, Father, that you would use us in a mighty way, each one of us, corporately as a church, but each individual would just find their purpose on the earth. Because we know that you made each person for a unique call. And you have graced each person 
with a set of gifts and passions and capacities. So just receive that right now. Just receive that commissioning, that I commission you out as missionaries in Los Angeles, in this region, as missionaries to spread the gospel, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse the lepers, to cast out demons, all in Jesus' name. You are the army of God. There's no one else we're looking to. Don't look around. You are it. The church is the army of God. That is scary and exciting. That when God had an idea decades ago, (laughs) he thought of you. And you were born for this time. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. If you need prayer for anything, come on up and get prayer.